Welcome you all to Wild Sarasota. This is a monthly webinar series. Often we focus on native animals here in Florida, but today we are going to be talking about some of our native plants and a very special group of native plants are ethereal epiphytes, uh, which are just such a unique and beautiful uh, group of plants that sort of give Florida much of its Florida sense of nature for many people that come here to visit. So a little bit about me, if you haven't been to one of my programs before, I'm Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. I do a lot of different programming, including the Florida Master Naturalist Program, uh, which is an adult education program through the University of Florida that teaches about our Florida's ecosystems. Uh, Project WILD, which is a program, a national program, but here in Florida, it's run by the um, FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. But Project WILD is a train the trainer sort of program where I train other educators to use conservation and wildlife activities and programming with uh, kids K through 12. And so as you can see, I just do a lot of different programming in both wildlife, conservation, native and invasive plant and animal species, and I also do a bunch of nature meditation and the health benefits of being in nature. A little bit of my backgrounds on the screen there. I have a bachelor's of science in environmental studies from uh, State University of New York in Buffalo, where I'm originally from and uh, did some environmental education for a few years after that, and then decided to be a physician for a little over 12 years. Uh, I came back to environmental education almost five years ago now when I started working here at University of Florida IFAS Extension. And I had the joy of living in Oscar Shear State Park for almost 20 years until just this year when we moved into town, as I like to call it, um, but really was surrounded by nature all the time when we lived out in Oscar Shear. So I had a lot of firsthand experience out there. And then I just wanna say thank you to Adelaide Mahler. She's not on the call today, but she was my uh, county, Sarasota County summer intern this past summer, as well as a volunteer. Uh, previous to that, and she has put together a lot of this presentation, and so uh, we can thank her for some of the great slides that we're going to see today. And she has gone back to school to continue on her future path. Here are some of the programming that we do at UFIFIS Extension Sarasota County. Uh, we're quite a large extension office with almost 30 staff and faculty that work here. And our extension offices are throughout the state. There's one associated with all 67 counties in the state. And they are partnerships between that county, University of Florida, which is the land grant university here and the USDA. Um, but really each extension office is focused on meeting the needs of their community. And we have quite a large and varied community here in Sarasota County. We have urban, rural, agricultural interests. And so we have programming that reflects all of those um, interests and stakeholders in our community. And our job is to provide education and resources that are science-based to our community to help solve issues that are occurring here in Sarasota County. So you can see across the board, all sorts of neat programs that we do in all areas that we have experts in um, to assist you. So please feel free to make use of our services. Uh, here are some of the logos of the programs that we do here. Um, there's the Florida Master Naturals program in the upper right hand corner, uh, which I am very involved in. Um, Wilma's very involved in Florida Friendly Landscaping and the Master Gardeners, and the Master Gardeners are a huge volunteer base um, for us here in Sarasota County as well as throughout the state, so we're really grateful for all of their information and service to our community. Um, and then lots of other things that happen here at our office. All right, so let's move on with our topic for the day, the epiphytes of Florida. So these are the things we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk in general, what makes a plant an epiphyte. We're gonna talk about uh, some example species of Florida epiphytes. We'll talk mostly about bromeliads today, and then we're gonna see how my timing goes and see if we have enough time to talk about orchids, ferns, and lichens as well. Of course, bromeliads and orchids uh, belong to the flowering plant category and ferns and lichens are non-flowering plants. 
And then we're going to talk about epiphyte conservation. We're going to talk about the ecological importance that these plants have to our ecosystems, the threats, especially to bromeliads, and then a recent success story that has been shared with me. So what is an epiphyte? So if we translate that word, epi means on or around and phyte means plant. So it's a plant that grows on or around another plant. And so these plants are usually found growing on trees or shrubbery. So they're arboreal, they're growing up above the ground as opposed to terrestrial. Now you can find some of these plants on the ground that is possible, but they really most likely are found up in the trees, on vines, on shrubs and off of the ground. They do not need to be in direct contact with the ground. So even if they are on the ground, they don't need to be on the ground to live, which is really what makes them an epithet. They are able to obtain nutrients in the air and through rainfall. Uh, and so they have specialized adaptations that allow them to be what we commonly call them, which is air plants. And they are not parasitic. So a lot of times people that aren't familiar with epiphytes think that they are parasitic and they are actually causing harm to the plant that is supporting them. And that is not true. That is a myth. They are solely using the plant, their host plant, for support and to attach to. There are three main categories of epiphytes in Florida, which I just mentioned in the previous slide. So let's jump right into the flowering epiphytic plants and most specifically the bromeliads. So bromeliads are members of the bromeliaceae family. They are perennial herbs that lack woody stems and they are flowering plants. They are not mosses as sometimes some of these are commonly called. There are 16 Florida species that are native here and then two naturally occurring hybrids. So out of that, 10 of them are listed as threatened or endangered. So not only are these such a unique and amazing plant that is very visually representative of Florida, um, they also are plants that really are in need of conservation. Um, 12 of the species and the two hybrids are affected by the evil weevil or the Mexican bromeliad weevil. And I'm going to explain that to you in, um, in a few minutes after we go through some of the species. I'll tell you all about the evil weevil, so stay tuned. Some of the characteristics of bromeliads are they have waxy coated leaves and they're often brightly colored. The leaves themselves are often like bright green. Um, you can see on this picture, sort of yellowish green. Uh, they absorb water and minerals through something called trichomes, which are special epidermal cellular structures that absorb water and minerals from the leaf surface. So I, that's the whole scientific definition. So uh, especially when I'm talking to kids and that, that definition is not going to work with kids, I like to talk about they have sort of specialized cells that are adapted to act like sponges. So they're able to absorb um, water from the surrounding humid air. And that's why you will most likely find these in areas where uh, there's a lot of humidity. You're not going to find these plants up in the middle of Buffalo, New York. Uh, they are not solely unique to Florida, but they are unique to areas that are damp and humid. And then some of the bromeliads are called tank bromeliads because they hold water between their leaf axles. I'm going to show you a good picture of that in a second, but first we have some trivia. So see if you can answer this question for me. You can put your answer in the chat box. Bromeliads are members of the bromeliaceae family, as I just mentioned. That family is otherwise known as the what family? Is it the banana family, the dragon fruit family, the papaya family, or the pineapple family? That yes, bromeliads are members of the bromeliaceae family, which is also commonly known as the pineapple family. So there is a, this is not one of our native ones, this is probably a specimen from a nursery, but here's an example of a tank bromeliad. And so the tanks, this is the tank right here in the center, and the tank is basically formed by all of the leaf axles coming together in some of these, <clears throat> excuse me, larger bromeliads. 
and um, creating a place where water is stored. And some of the some of the strategies or adaptations of this tank is that it allows um, plant material or insects to be trapped there in the water. And then through decay and decomposition, the plant is able to absorb those nutrients and also the water from its tank. So it's basically creating itself like a ready-made place to eat and drink. Um, Catopsis berturoniana, um, is considered carnivorous and this adaptation allows it to extend its range um, because it's able to get nutrients from the insects that are actually being trapped in there. Uh, so I think it's a broad use of the word carnivorous, um, but it is getting this particular, in fact, all three of the Catopsa species are getting nutrients from the insects that are being trapped in there and decomposing. Uh, these tanks also provide habitat for things like mosquito larvae, which we may not be excited about, but every species has a place. Um, so the mosquito larva can live here and certainly other invertebrates and even small vertebrates like some of our tree frogs, for instance, might utilize these tanks as habitats. So that's one of the importance and uh, ecologically and also one of the ecosystem services that these plants offer. So this is an example of one of the catopsis, the one I mentioned on the previous slide, also known as powdery strap air plant. So these are very rare, they are endangered, but it is one of the three carnivorous bromeliads in the catopsis family or catopsis genus. So I thought I would just share a picture with you. It is of course, one of our tank epiphytes. It has yellow green leaves with a white chalky powder, which is one of its identifying features. So you can sort of see that white chalky powder, I'm trying to get my cursor to work, right here. So at the base of the leaves, it'll have that white chalky um, flower powder, and they can be 16 to 18 inches tall when flowering. It prefers strong light, so it's gonna be higher up on the branches of its host tree. And it's mostly found in Collier, Dade, and mainland Monroe County, so it doesn't have a very large range, as well as the fact that it it is endangered and there aren't a lot of this plant left. So small range and being endangered is not a good combination. Uh, so this is an important one for us to try to conserve. Here is the giant air plant. Uh, this is a picture I took about three years ago, I believe in Minnesota scrub. And probably if I had stood next to this, if I'd had somebody else with me and I could have stood next to this plant, it would probably have been taller than me or at least as tall as me. So it's hard to see because there's so much amazing greenery here, but let me get my cursor. Here's um, the giant air plant or Tillandsia utriculata. Here's the base and the leaves here. This whole thing is its florette, its flower. So this is the flower stock of this plant. Just absolutely amazing. So these giant air plants are tank epiphytes as well. They can be 12 feet tall and they can have 20 to 75 greenish to grayish leaves. And the leaves can be two and a half feet long. So when I say 12 feet tall, that's like the whole plant with the inflorescence. Um, but the leaves itself can be about two and a half feet tall. Uh, the flowers, which you can't really see here, are going to be small and they're going to be white with purple ends. And then what's interesting about this one is seeds are actually released the following year. And these plants, when they're healthy, so this is one of the ones we're going to come back to and talk about um, conservation efforts for, um, but when these plants are healthy, they can live up to 20 years. It was very frequent in Florida. You can see it is now endangered. I've put some, um, some little, uh, little things on the slides here to indicate their status, whether they're endangered, threatened, or common. So this one used to be common until the introduction of the Mexican bromeliad weevil. And um, of course, also it has other issues like habitat loss, um, but now it is considered endangered. It does range, it does occur throughout the Florida Peninsula, West Indies, Mexico, and Central and South America. 
And here's one of the other really large ones that are native here, the cardinal air plant, the Tillandsia fasciculata, um, also a tank epiphyte with long, stiff, leathery gray-green leaves in groups of 20 to 50 per plant. Um, it has a red or sometimes yellow, green, or pinkish um, floral bract. So I'm gonna go back a few slides because these were the same plant, hold on, right here. So you can see amazing sort of bright red, sometimes pinkish um, floral bracts for these. Hence their name, cardinal. Uh, so leaves are longer in the shade while the plant compacts and becomes redder in full sun. So some of these, and we'll see this with the southern needle leaf too, some of these tillandsias, their leaves will turn a bit reddish or really reddish um, when they are in direct sun. These will be found in hammocks and cypress swamps. They do prefer full sun and they are in Florida and Central and South America, but also in danger due to illegal collecting uh, the Mexican bromeliad weevil and habitat loss. And so of course it is illegal to collect any of these plants that are on the endangered or threatened list, although unfortunately it still does happen. Uh, which is partly why when I do presentations like this, I'm not going to talk about exact locations where some of these are found or um, being relocated to. So this is, this is my favorite one. And oh, Wilma, I have some pictures in here of a trip that you and I took together where we saw so many southern needle leaves. So this is a southern needle leaf, um, it, also called Tillandsia cetacea. And these are much smaller. So whereas the um, fasciculata and utriculata are quite large air plants, um, this southern needle leaf is more about that size. They can get a little bit bigger, but in general, they sort of occur almost, you know, in a ball. Um, and they are densely clustered, growing sort of in tufts, like you see here. Uh, the leaves, which are small, and you can't really see on this picture, but but they are a little bit swollen at their base and they have a slight, slight curve to their tips. We're gonna see ball moss in a few minutes, which sometimes is easy to confuse with the Southern needle leaf. The way I more easily tell the difference is I feel like the Southern needle leaf, first of all, they really are very thin and needle-like in terms of their leaves. And they just, they just bend or slightly curve like we see in this picture. Whereas with ball moss, there's a lot more potential sort of curving or spiraling to the leaves. Also, our southern needle leaf is going to often be reddish, um, either slightly reddish on the tips like we see in this plant here, or in a minute, I'm going to show you a picture of like an entire magical forest of southern needle leaf epiphytes. And the light was hitting them. The picture doesn't even do it justice, but they were so red. Um, probably because they'd had a lot of direct sunlight because they were in oak trees where at that point in time, it was in February and there weren't a lot of leaves on their um, host trees. So I think they were getting more direct sun. They were just beautiful. Um, so the Southern needle leaf occurs in hammocks and swamps. It's found in many counties across Florida. Uh, I see this one in a lot of our Sarasota County parks and preserves, as well as Mayaka. So if you're in Sarasota, you're commonly going to see this. Uh, this picture here <clears throat> was taken at Sleeping Turtles Preserve North. So this is a picture I took at Booker Creek Preserve up in Pinellas County. And I just had to talk about it because it's such a beautiful epiphyte. It is also the only species of epiphyte known to be endemic to Florida, meaning it only occurs here in our state and nowhere else in the world. So I always love to highlight endemic plants and animals because I just think it's so amazing. Um, this will not occur in Sarasota, or at least it's not known to occur in Sarasota. I haven't seen one in Sarasota, but it does occur in counties around us, even Manatee and Hardy County, I believe. And then of course this picture was from Pinellas. Uh, but the plants are single or sometimes in clusters. They're eight to 16 inches tall. So they're sort of 
um, in the middle category between the southern needle leaf that we just saw and then some of the larger ones like the cardinal and giant air plant. Um, tall, pointy, leathery grayish leaves, and then just this beautiful pinkish flower spike. It says it has reddish bracts, which you could see some that are reddish, but this one was definitely pinkish in my opinion. And then it'll have five to 30 violet flowers. So this is the flower spike, get my cursor. This is my, the flower spikes. And then on each of these bracts here, that's where the little smaller flowers will emerge. So often with the epiphytes, what you're gonna notice, you're either gonna notice the clump of leaves up in a tree, or if you're lucky and it's flowering, you're gonna see the flower spike, um, but you're probably gonna have to get closer up to see some of those actual flowers. All right, so here's our ball moss. So you can see this is called Tillandsia ray curvata. So even with our scientific names, the, they're often derived from Latin names that represent either where the plant was found, who initially found the plant, or um, often from a characteristic of the plant. So these have sort of recurving type leaves. And you can also see that they almost have like a silvery um, sort of covering to the leaves. So if you get close up to them, they definitely look different from the southern needle leaf. Sorry about that. Uh, so they're small tufted gray green plant. They often have a collection of small plants or pups that are growing together. Um, and they're only about one and a half to at the most eight inches. So a lot of times you'll find these on the ground where they've fallen off their host plant or um, they're on vines that are near the ground and they look like a little ball, but unlike the southern needle leaf, they're gonna be more sort of twisty and curvy in terms of their leaf characteristics. And these prefer high light conditions and broadleaf trees, but they're especially common on live oaks. And they range anywhere from southeastern US all the way into Central and South America. So they have a little bit more further of a northern range than some of our other epiphytes. So I just have some pictures to share with you. Um, this is a uh, this is a giant air plant up in probably looks like a live oak. Um, we see oh I see lots of stuff I didn't even notice before. So there's a lot of southern needle leaf in here. So all of these smaller epiphytes are most likely southern needle leaf. You can see they have a slightly reddish tinge, but I also see of course I see some lichens, which are epiphytic as well. But I also, I think I might even see some butterfly orchid leaves right in there too. Uh, so if we have time, we'll get to talking about butterfly orchids and lichens also. And then here's the photo from when Wilma and I went on a walk in Sleeping Turtles North Preserve together. And it was just, it was a magical day. It was so beautiful. So of course we have a lot of our, oh, are those cabbage palms? I think they're cabbage palms, might have some salt palmetto over here, but then we have a whole bunch of live oaks, but look at just all the reddish tinged southern needle leaf all over. It was so beautiful. Um, so definitely a great preserve to take a walk in if you want to see epiphytes. Um, some of our other preserves, Jelks is wonderful. Um, sleeping Turtles South is wonderful. So there's a Sleeping turtle South and a Sleeping Turtles North. Um, and both of them have good examples of epiphytes. And of course, Mayaka River State Park as well. All right, so we have another trivia question for you guys. So Spanish moss, which is pictured here, is a true moss, true or false? Once again, you guys are brilliant. So it is not a true moss. So Spanish moss is a bromeliad and it's actually a flowering bromeliad. And I can remember the first time I actually noticed the flowers because they are really tiny. How many of you have actually noticed a flower on Spanish moss? It's, it's hard to notice unless you're really looking close at it. 
it. And most of us just, we're, you know, we're so used to Spanish moss that we don't pay that much attention to it and get really up close. There isn't a flower in this picture, so I'm going to have to go out and take a picture of a flower to show you guys next time I do this presentation. But the flowers will be like right in here and they'll just be this little, little, little tiny um, sort of like purplish, lightest violet sort of flower. Um, so really neat to find if you can go out looking for one. Uh, so these occur in pendant strands. So of course, as we know, they hang down from um, many of our trees, especially our live oak trees. They do really well. Many of our epiphytes do really well in live oaks because live oaks have those really furrowed bark. Um, so lots of little nooks and crannies for the epiphytes, for the seeds to sort of take hold. Also those nooks and crannies in the bark of the tree help collect water and nutrients as well. So it's just a great place for many of our epiphytes to live. Um, so the flowers are only about a half inch and they're purple and tubular. And it does flower throughout the year. So you can go on outside after this presentation, see if you have any flowers on your Spanish moss. They prefer being up high as well um, because that's where they're gonna get the most light. And they tend to thrive on weak or I wouldn't say dead trees, but I would say weakened trees that have less foliage. So there is a common myth that these epiphytes, especially Spanish moss, will actually cause the tree to die. And that is not true, but it is true that we often see more Spanish moss on weakened or dying trees that the tree is already unhealthy. And then it's just a better place for the Spanish moss to take up residence because it's gonna get more light if the tree is unhealthy and not producing as many leaves. Spanish moss has the broadest geographic range of bromeliads and it can withstand extreme temperature changes and low rainfall. So it's got some, uh, some behavioral plasticity or tolerance for different conditions, which does allow it to have a broader geographic range. And it does provide habitat for uh, many of our native species like bats and um, our state butterfly that we see here, which is the zebra longwing. It also provides habitat for nesting birds like some of our warblers and orioles. And I'm gonna tell you, let me just check. Yes, good. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of history about um, our Spanish moss because I just think it's got a really interesting um, history here in Florida, but also in Louisiana. Uh, there in Florida, there were 35 Spanish moss processing plants and the Spanish moss was processed and used to stuff car cush cushions like some of our first Model T Fords and also used for mattresses and upholstery. Our last Spanish moss factory in our state burned down in 1958. Uh, Spanish moss is still used today for crafts and local trade. You can find it in craft stores. It's used to make wreaths out of. So it still has current use, but not to the degree that it did before. So I'm gonna show you some historical pictures and tell you a little bit about the history of the use of Spanish moss. I found this really amazing document from um, the Department of Agriculture from June of 1947. And so in this document, it talked about how Spanish moss was ginned. And this is a picture from a home gin in Jacksonville, Florida from 1940. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the kids um, putting the Spanish moss out to dry. So there was a step before this, actually a couple steps. So basically what they used to do is they would collect Spanish moss and they would use a pole to collect it and pull it down out of the trees. You could collect it from the ground because we've all seen Spanish moss lying on the ground, but the better quality Spanish moss was usually the one hanging up in the tree that hadn't been allowed to sit on the ground for too long. And they usually collected it in fall and winter when the younger plants had more fully matured. It was just a better quality. So they would collect a bunch of moss and then they would do a process called pitting. So they would dig these pits and they would put the Spanish moss in the pits and cover it with water and then let it sit there 
for a few months, then they would turn it over and add more water and let it sit for a couple more months. And this process was done so that this light grayish green, let me go back to the picture of it here. Hold on. Oh, that was the one I wanted. Okay, so notice in this picture, um, the Spanish moss looks really sort of silvery grayish green. This is a live growing healthy Spanish moss. But what we want to use as stuffing is the internal part of that. So the grayish green on the outside is like the little scale leaves as well as the bark of the Spanish moss, which really isn't bark. But the growing part is the lightish grayish green. And what we want is the internal, internal fiber, which is actually black. So the, the process where they dug the pits allowed for that grayish green substance to decay or decompose away and leave what we're seeing here in this black and white photo, which actually is the black fibrous portion inside the plant. And sometimes you'll see that when you're out walking around in our parks and preserves, you'll see some like stringy, it feels like horsehair even, some stringy horsehair like black substance on the ground. That's actually old Spanish moss where the living portion has decayed away. So this is the part they used as stuffing. So after they did that pitting process, decayed away the outside covering, they pulled the remaining fiber out of the pit, and then of course they have to hang it to dry. So that's what you're seeing here. And then they will put it through a gin, just like cotton used to be put through a ginning process as well. And so this, this mechanism will help separate, uh, you know, sticks and leaves and other things from that fiber that they really want to use. And then here is a group of women and children that are now stuffing mattresses with the Spanish moss fiber. And this was so readily available. Once it had gone through this process, it was very clean. And so it actually was a preferred stuffing to things like horsehair uh, for a very long time. And in the 30s and 40s, this was um, part of our state's economy. I have a couple figures that I thought were very interesting. Um, let me find those and share those with you. So I found a document from the Louisiana Conservation Review because Louisiana had a much bigger um, ginning of Spanish moss economy than we even did here in Florida. And it said in 1930, the Spanish moss industry is already producing between two and a half million to three million dollars per year. So millions of dollars per year out of one state in 1930, that was a lot of money. It was being used to manufacture bridles, saddle blankets, horse collars, pillows, bed mattresses, um, seat cushions and cars as we heard. And it has gradually become more and more in demand due to its cleanliness and cheapness. So there you go, a little interesting part of our Southern history, especially here in Florida and in Louisiana. Um, also in 1930, 100,000 pounds of green moss were sold that year. So that's the moss before it goes through this process. In addition, 20,000 pounds of cured moss and the green moss was sold at two and a half cents a pound and the cured moss at three cents a pound. So there you go. And I think I read somewhere in this document that laborers in the ginning facilities received about one and a half to two dollars a day, I believe. It's a little piece of our history. All right, I think I might have some time to briefly do orchids, uh, ferns, and lichens, and then I want to make sure I save enough time for the conservation story at the end, as well as time for questions from you guys. So I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker um, than I did with the bromeliads, and I just have a couple of each as examples. Uh, so orchids, of course, are one of the largest flowering plant families with 30,000 species. Uh, they have, many of them have become rare or endangered due to over collecting because of course they're just absolutely beautiful. Um, flowers tend to have three petals and three sepals. 
They have a landing pad or labellum for pollinators. So many of these have, have co-evolved with specific pollinators and their flower has evolved in such a way to attract that particular pollinator or family of pollinators. Uh, orchids have bilateral symmetry or the flower does. And there are two types of growth, the monopodial, which is a single stem, or the sympodial, um, which is multiple stem. So here is the Florida butterfly orchid. This is the one that you're most likely to see out and about here in Sarasota County. Uh, so here are some pictures. Once again, these are from Booker Creek in Pinellas, but in some of those preserves and Mayaka River State Park that I mentioned earlier, uh, you're going to find these butterfly orchids as well. They have one or two slender grass-like leaves that are about 12 inches long, and their flowers are about one to one and a half inches across with green sepals and petals with a little bit of red. So you can see that here in the flower. You've got a very yellowish flower with a bit of red. Um, they are trilobed with third and central lip being fan-shaped and spotted with that reddish purplish color that you see there. They like hammocks and swamps, so they're often going to be found with other epiphytes as we see here in these pictures. I see some resurrection fern, might see some ball moss right there, some lichens, so they, they like that same type of environment. Um, they do prefer living on the live oak, but they can grow on a variety of other trees that are found in these habitats. And they will be found in Central and South Florida, whereas the green fly orchid, which is our other common epiphytic orchid, will be found more from here north. Uh, and they have a pseudo bulb, so you can see that. That's a really good picture up here at the top, actually, where you can sort of see their pseudo bulb. So a lot of times they're not going to be flowering when you see them, but their leaves and that pseudo bulb are great identification features of them. So I'm going to talk briefly about the ghost orchid. I am not at all an expert on the ghost orchid. Uh, so I didn't want to go too deep into it. There are so many people that are doing wonderful work on the ghost orchid, and I have a great article that I found um, that I can share the link with you um, that you can read more and see some absolutely beautiful pictures um, that Carlton Ward took. So I'll share that, but I'll just give you a little brief inf information on just this amazing orchid. So this is a leafless orchid that has a network of photosynthetic roots. And you can see that on the picture here, the roots are, and any of you that grow orchids, you know that these are the orchid roots here. Um, so they are on the trunk of the tree and they are green, meaning they can have photosynthetic ability. So they are making some of the food for this amazing plant. Um, this plant has a mutualistic relationship with fungus that helps to gather nutrients in exchange for the sugars that are produced through the photosynthetic process of the orchid. And the greenish white flower with these long strips that are hanging off that lip give it the nickname of white frog orchid as well. I think ghost orchid is more mysterious and beautiful though. So it likes to be on the central trunk of trees like the cypress, pond apple, and palm trees um, in places um, down a little further south of here like the Fakahatchee and Corkscrew. So in those really amazing uh, cypress swamp areas. It needs high humidity, mild temperatures, and dappled shade in order to live. Um, and like soil dwelling orchids, it is dependent on fungi like I just mentioned. So it is native to Florida and Cuba, so not a lot of areas um, does it occur in. It is estimated that there's only about 2,000 left, and so it is endangered due to habitat destruction and overcollecting. So unfortunately, this one is one that is illegally collected, uh, and, and there's really, you know, there's really no reason for it. I mean, not only from a conservation ethic, um, but also because this orchid is so delicate that it does not survive well if moved or tried to transport it. So even if it is collected, it's most likely going to die. Um, it blooms June through July. 
and its sweet night scent attracts a special group of moss called the Sphinx moss. And here I've got one example. And uh, this is the link to the article. And I know you can't click on the slide while we're in presentation. So I'll try to share that link with you after the presentation. Um, but it talks about uh, when Carlton Ward Jr. and Max Stone went out and took photos and tried to identify some of the moths that were actually pollinating our ghost orchids. And these were um, four species listed on your slide that they did identify as pollinating. And this is the pawpaw sphinx moth that I have pictures of here. I have the caterpillar in the upper right. And then this is the pupa stage. And then this is the moth that it turns into. And our sphinx moths, or sometimes they're also called hawk moths, H-A-W-K, because they are really large. These are some of the largest moths that you'll see here in Florida. They aren't as large as the Luna moth, but they're still pretty large. Um, I've seen ones as big as the palm of my hand, for instance. Uh, so really unique moths. They have a proboscis that is sometimes about four to five times longer than their actual body. Uh, so they have co-evolved with this ghost orchid to be able to reach down into it and um, gather its nectar. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about ferns. So this is the resurrection fern, one of my absolute favorite plants, although I have a lot of them. Um, this will have fronds that are four to 12 inches in length and most often found on our live oak trees. It is known for resurrecting, hence its common name. Um, its scientific name is Pleopeltis polypoidioides. Big, big word. Um, but these leaves or their fronds will shrivel up during dry times and will basically look like the plant is dead. For someone that doesn't know the story of the resurrection fern, they would probably just think it was a whole bunch of dead leaves on the trunk and branches of an oak tree. Um, but then as soon as it rains, it just comes back to life. It is able to suck up and absorb the water that is needed and resurrects itself. It can lose up to 75% of water in a normal dry period and even upwards of 97% during an extreme drought. So it really is able to tolerate excessively dry conditions that most plants would not be able to tolerate. It does range throughout the Southeast. So it is in a number of states in the Southeast, not just here in Florida. And a fun fact was that in 1997, it was actually brought into space aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. So here's some pictures of some desiccated uh, resurrection ferns. So this is when it's all dried up. And then as soon as it rains again, that's just gonna come back to life and be brilliant emerald green. Oh, here's another one. I'm really partial to ferns. So this is another one of my favorite ones. Uh, this plant has lots of common names. I like to call it the licorice fern, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I also like to call it the rabbit's foot fern, but I think most people call it the golden poly polypody. Um, but I think there's a few other names as well. Uh, Phlebodium aureum is its scientific name. Aureum is, translates as gold. So that speaks back to the golden polypody. So let me tell you, as I tell you a little bit about the common names, it will explain to you some of these plant characteristics. So let's talk about rabbit's foot. So this fern has a rhizome and you can see the rhizome sort of usually right at the base of the um, petiole or stalk of the fern leaf. And the rhizome will be in amongst those cabbage tree boots or cabbage palm boots. Um, so that's a very common place for this fern to live. And why it gets its rabbit's foot name is because those rhizomes are covered with these golden yellowish scales and they look furry like a rabbit's foot. And they're about the size sometimes of a rabbit's foot. Uh, that's also how it got its Latin name and its golden polypody name. So polypody means many feet. So lots of different rabbit's feet or lots of different rhizomes and they're golden. So the other common name, licorice fern, refers to the fact that if you eat some of this rhizome, which I am not recommending for you to do because there's lots of um, constituents in ferns that can cause things like kidney disease, but 
the rhizomes do actually have a licorice flavor. So hence its other common name. All right, let's see what I didn't cover. I think I might've said almost everything. Um, of course, our ferns are not flowering plants, so they reproduce through spores. Uh, so usually on the backside of many of our ferns is where you'll find the sporangia or sori. Um, sori are like the clumps of the spores. And each of the ferns have different patterns of how those occur, and that can help you identify the specific fern. But these range throughout peninsular Florida, and they're often found in moist hammocks. And they are sold as a house plant too. And usually Wilma and I, when we do our invasive species class, we tell you over and over and over again, not to plant your house plants outdoors. But this is a plant that if it is the Phlebodium aureum, it is native to Florida and you actually could get it as a house plant or plant it outdoors. And then our last fern example, this one's just so cool. This is the shoestring fern. I just love this one because it doesn't look anything like what I think of as a fern. Um, so once again, all these plants are epiphytes that we're talking about. So you see this one also favors um, cabbage palms and sort of the spaces in between where the boots of the cabbage palm were. And this does look like shoestrings or shoelaces or like pieces of green spaghetti. Um, or clumps of grass growing on a tree. So it's just so unique to see because it's not what you expect to see usually. Um, it's gonna be in moist hammocks. Uh, I see it a lot in Mayaka River State Park is one of the common places that I see it, but I've also seen it in Sleeping Turtles South Preserve. Um, these can be about 12 to 24 inches long. Um, and it is throughout most of peninsular Florida, as well as in Georgia, one county in Georgia, and <laughs> Central and South America. All right, so trivia time. How much water can a normal plant, so we talked about the resurrection fern being able to lose anywhere from 75% to 90% of its water and still be able to resurrect but that's its special adaptation. So if we're not talking about the resurrection fern, we're talking about normal plants, how much water can a normal plant lose before it is beyond the point of survival? 10%. So most plants can really only lose about 10% of their water before they're gonna just wilt and probably not survive. So that resurrection fern is really amazing. I'm gonna give you like one slide on lichens. Uh, lichens are very unique. There's a lot of um, differences and uniqueness about lichens. There's also a lot of things that are not known about lichens. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them today, uh, but they are very unique. This is um, an example of a crustose form of a lichen. So lichens can occur in three different forms, crustose, which are impossible to pry from the surface. They look like a paint smear. So I'm sure you've seen those before. Um, the folios version of lichens are ones that are leafy and um, the thalli or the main body of the lichen can actually be in folds that come off the surface. And then there's a fruticose um, group of lichens, which are shrubby and lift off the surface on which they have established themselves. There's about 13,000 to 30,000 species of lichens. We're not even sure how many species there are. And they tend to be circular or elliptical on trunks, branches, and twigs. So here's another example. And I'm not gonna go through all of this on this slide. Um, but I just want to say that lichens are a symbiotic relationship often between a fungus and an algae, but they also can be a relationship between an algae and a bacteria. Um, so each species of plant is or animal is providing something to each other in these relationships. Um, for instance, when it's a fungi and an alga, the fungus doesn't photosynthesize, so it drives nutrients that it can share with the algae, but the algae can photosynthesize. Um, so just such a unique, amazing relationship between plants that create an epiphytic plant that we call a lichen. All right, so I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about 
um, the Mexican bromeliad weevil, and then tell you an amazing conservation story that is occurring right here in Sarasota County. Um, I think some of the people involved might even be on the call today, so they are welcome to share because I am telling you the story secondhand, so hopefully I will do it justice. Um, but first I wanna talk about the ecological role or the importance of epiphytes. Um, I've already said a number of these things, but they do help with nu nutrient cycling. So throughout our environment, we do nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling, water cycling. There's all sorts of nutrient cycles that occur that are necessary for all forms of life. And so bromeliads and other epiphytes are an important part of those nutrient cycles. Um, they also provide unique habitat, which we already talked about, and they are an important aspect of our biodiversity, especially here in Florida. And it, I think one of the most important things to share with other people, especially people that aren't used to our Florida environment, is that these epiphytes do not cause harm to host plants because that is the biggest myth out there. And then sometimes people think they're doing the right thing by removing some of these because they think they're harming the host plant and they're not. So these are many of the threats that our epiphytes and mainly our bromeliads face. Uh, so certainly many of our natural species are facing development, um, which causes habitat destruction and loss and fragmentation. And so that's impacting numerous species here in Florida. Um, also, as I mentioned, the over collecting of these plants, which for most of them is actually illegal, especially the ones that are threatened and endangered that is causing an impact. Um, herbicides, for instance, uh, we use a lot of copper-based herbic copper herbicides in our citrus groves and our epiphytes, especially our bromeliads, are very sensitive to the copper. And so um, they are not gonna be able to exist in an area where those copper sprays are being used. And uh, just the misinformation, the myths that are out there that they're either incorrectly considered weeds or people think that they are causing destruction to the trees that they're on. And our, one of our biggest threats to the majority of the bromeliads we talked about today is that insect that I was calling the evil weevil or the Mexican bromeliad weevil. And you see a picture of it here on the slide. And I'm gonna show you a few other pictures on the next slide and tell you a little bit more about this little monkey. So here are some adult forms of the evil weevil. Um, this looks like a larva that might be emerging. Um, so the Mexican bromeliad weevil, or oh, this one I have a hard time, I'm better with plant terms, Metamaceus calizona, uh, native to Central and South America, not native to Florida, although we do have a native bromeliad weevil that's in the same genus, and I have a little, little bit about it here at the bottom. Um, it looks different. It is red with black spots, and it does not cause the same level of destruction to our native bromeliads because, once again, the native insect and the native plant have co-evolved over thousands of years, whereas the Mexican bromeliad weevil was brought in and our native bromeliads had not evolved with it. And so it is causing immense destruction to our native bromeliads, especially to our larger ones, like the Tillandsia utriculata and Tillandsia fasciculata. Uh, the bromeliad, the Mexican bromeliad weevil was first found in Florida in 1989. It was found in Palm Beach and Broward counties. And by a year later, it had gone from the eastern coast of our state over to Lee County on the western coast of our state. And then by 2009, so 20 years later, the Mexican bromeliad weevil is now found in almost all counties in central and south Florida. So it had it dispersed quite easily. It has three to four continuous generations per year in Florida. So like many of our invasive species, it has um, many cycles of reproduction. And then all life stages of the weevil utilize the plant. Adults and larvae will eat the leaves. And then the females will create a slit on the leaf and lay their eggs in there. And then when the eggs hatch, the larva will burrow into the center of the plant stem and pupate in there. And I was out a few years ago 
um, with Debbie Blanco, who is very active in conservation efforts for the bromeliads. And she used to be one of our land managers in Sarasota County. But I was out walking with her at Sleeping Turtles South, I think. <clears throat> and we found a plant. I have a picture coming up. We found a plant on the ground that we pulled apart and um, actually found adult stage, larval stage, and then a number of pupas that were, you know, about as big as my thumb that were about ready to hatch into the adult. Um, so these do dramatic damage. This is uh, a larva down here in sort of the center base part of the plant that is basically just eating away, desiccating and destroying the plant um, from the inside out. Uh, there was a parasitoid fly that was released in Florida to try to kill the weevil larva. Uh, and it had in Honduras, which was its native range, good fatality rates of um, killing the Mexican bromeliad weevil from anywhere from five to 67%. So um, we did try to have a biocontrol that would address this Mexican bromeliad weevil, um, but it has not been as successful as we would like. So here, oh, Sleeping Turtles North Preserve that I was at. Um, so I think this is Debbie right here and we're pulling apart this plant. Um, or this, oh no, this was last year. So this was another one that I found with her and previously I'd been at Sleeping Turtles North um, or Sleeping Turtles South where we had actually found the larva. And then here is another plant that I found in April of last year in Oscar Shear that had also unfortunately been destroyed by the weevil. And so this is what you'll see for ones that have been infested. They will often fall down. Um, their leaves will often turn yellowish, brownish. Um, and if, um, if they are dead, um, often they'll be in parts like this and in that center part you may still find examples of the actual larva or the pupa. You can see this one has been chewed away as well. Uh, so just a reminder, I've already said it a bunch of times, but here's my slide that reminds us that um, you cannot remove or transport um, or relocate any endangered plant without both written permission of the landowner and a collecting permit. Um, so there are numerous endangered plants here in Florida, well over 400 of them. Uh, and I can share that link with you, which is a link to the list of our Florida endangered plants, federally endangered, as well as our threatened plants and commercially exploited. So um, I'm gonna try to do justice to the story um, that has been occurring these past few months um, here in Sarasota County. So I first got involved in this story on March 8th when uh, one of my prior master naturalist students contacted me uh, because she had been contacted by someone who had found a number of uh, Talanzias that were on a lot in Port Charlotte that was slated to be sold and developed. Uh, so on 2021, 55 plants were rescued from this lot. There were 25 large giant air plants. Um, so large means their leaf length was larger than 24 inches. So their leaves were larger than two feet. Um, 25 medium-sized ones and five small plants. So really an amazing selection of 55 of these giant air plants that were rescued. Um, on July 30th, uh, two people um, that got very involved in this effort uh, returned to that to a lot that was chosen to replace uh, two of the large Talanzia utriculatas in a heritage live oak. So actually what you're seeing on the screen here is some of the rescued air plants um, that Ernie and Donna were involved in rescuing and trying to make sure they were healthy before they were relocated and returned to an area where they could hopefully um, live a healthy long 20 plus years. Uh, some of these giant air plants actually had floral spikes on them, like you see here. Here's um, a couple more pictures of 
uh, them just making sure that the air plants are healthy. Uh, they did do some treatment for the bromeliad weevils before they return them. And so here's a picture here of um, Ernie putting one of the largest ones into a heritage live oak in August. Uh, so basically they rescued them in March and then made sure they were healthy, treated them if necessary throughout the upcoming months and didn't return them until um, July, end of July, beginning of August. You see one over here as well and one right here as well that they returned. Um, See what else I want to share with you. Uh, five medium plants were placed in a local preserve as well, uh, but there was unfortunately some attrition of plants due to overabundance of water and relocation from the ground to being in the air. Uh, the ones they returned to the tree had been on vines, not on the ground, so they are healthy and happy as you can see in these photos. Uh, so, you know, also trying to think about very conscientiously if, uh, if someone is doing some conservation efforts, and once again, you cannot relocate these, remove these, unless you have permission and you're permitted to do it. So, um, but when these efforts are undergone, there's a lot of thought put into this in terms of um, are they healthy? Do they need treatment? And then where are they going to be relocated to? And is that a place where they're going to thrive? So trying to get them back into a similar location and a similar situation um, that is a, like where they were found. So if they were found originally on the ground, then perhaps they're gonna do better if they're re relocated on the ground. If they were found on a vine or on a tree branch up in the air, then perhaps that's the better way to relocate them. So here's a really healthy looking specimen. Um, once again, this is one of those ones that we saw previously uh, that was placed on a heritage oak. It was placed near its site of origin that it had been removed from. So it is just looking healthy and happy. I know that they are also planning um, later this week to visit another location and hopefully relocate a few more of the giant air plants um, that is also very close to the place that they were originally removed from. Um, so that is just a wonderful story of 55 air plants and, you know, all of these amazing giant air plants uh, that are endangered, 55 of them that perhaps might have succumbed to development of this uh, plot of land. And because of a group of emails that went around to a number of people, we found uh, just the right people to take care of these plants, rehabilitate them and relocate them so that hopefully they will survive into the future. So thank you to those of you that were involved in that effort. Oh, th thank you, Je Catherine. And I just wanted to add, and I think you've covered it, but I wanted to be sure that it's really clear to everyone that all of this was done under a permit. There was a permit that was signed by the landowner, and then we worked with the Department of Plant industry to make sure that what we were doing was appropriate, um, consulted with other local experts, including Catherine, about the best places to put things. And as, as she mentioned, we'll be going to Tipikanu 2 mitigation area on Friday to hopefully ro relocate some there. And the idea being that that's as close to their place of origin as we could find some natural lands where they hopefully will be protected. And thank you for sharing this wonderful story. We're excited too, thank you. Well, thank you, Donna, for being here and for sharing some of that. And honestly, this, this is happening today because of your efforts and your story. So thank you very much. I hadn't even thought to put together an Epiphyte presentation <laughs> until I heard um, about your efforts and was involved in all of the emails. And I'm just so happy to share this information with more people uh, because these plants are just so beautiful and so important to our Florida culture and our Florida ecosystem. So we need to save them. Absolutely. And, and if anyone has plants at home, you can double check them or you see them just by, if, if they're ones you can reach, by pulling the center leaves. 
if this and and as long as they're nice and tight everything's healthy about that plant but that's often the first indication of their weevil damage and unfortunately uh, as you mentioned Catherine once a weevil the the metamasseus get in there the plant's going to die it's it's gone and since it can't reproduce until it's 20 years you know 15 to 20 years old and only by seed it's not as smart about reproduction as the weevil is so it's an uphill battle so again thank you for for sharing this it's really exciting thank you All right, and so here's some uh, more opportunities to learn more or get involved. So the Florida Native Plant Society and Adelaide put on here our local Sarasota chapter, which is the Saranoa chapter, but of course there are other chapters in our surrounding counties as well. So if you just look up Florida Native Plant Society, you can find your local chapter. So uh, joining, joining your local chapter, learning more about native plants, um, a lot of times, especially pre-COVID and hopefully it's sooner rather than later, the Native Plant Societies had walks that they sponsored. Um, now they're doing a lot of Zoom meetings like we are doing. So still opportunities to, uh, to grow and learn and experience things with like-minded people by joining your local Florida Native Plant Society chapter. There's also a Sarasota Bromeliad Society and a Sarasota Orchid Society. So lots to choose from. And you can always become a master gardener or a master naturalist and learn lots more about plants and Florida ecosystems. Uh, and really, I am a huge proponent of it all starts with education. The more each of us knows, we end up just sharing our stories with our friends, our family, with other people in very informal settings. And sometimes all it takes is a single word. I think Donna and Ernie shared with me that the gentleman who allowed those two large giant air plants to be relocated to his property is now a huge giant air plant fan. And he's talking to his neighbors about it. So it's not just the success of what um, we as a group helped accomplish by saving those 55 plants and hoping to relocate many of them. But the success goes on and on and on as people learn more and share more. So I want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I have my email there. It's kclements at scgov.net.